came for uh, eight years and uh, I built some of these houses in different parts of the world and I'm one of the instructors here. So I just want to have a few words and tell you a little bit about, about this place. Um, it's also nice to have a room, you know, of actual people. Actual people. You know what I mean? As a rather than, well, rather than sort of virtual, <laughs> digital friends. <laughs> like this, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and that's great stuff. But really, we have to show up in places. We have to come and really meet each other and say, well, hi, who are you? And what, you know, what are your concerns? And what do you care about? That happens when you show up places and you actually sit down and take a minute to, to breathe and, and meet people. So um, I, I really thank you, you know, for coming, coming out on Saturday and spending it with us. Um, all of the movements are foot right now in the world, and there's so much, I mean, there's a lot of crap going on that we're all aware of, things that are alarming and challenging, but there's a lot of wonderful things going on too, really inspiring things. Um, and uh, this business of sustainable living is a big part of it. And that's because it's no joke that the planet is a certain size and the population is soaring. So that will um, manifest itself in many ways, from food concerns to water concerns to energy concerns. And um, so I think to be here at Cal Earth, our contribution to the sustainability um, topic is obviously architecture. We are talking about sustainable ways to build, um, but we live in times where sustainability is sort of the word. It's the word of our time. And um, it's great to have continued interest in our work and uh, the website that we have and our, our uh, have one of these little meters that clocks how many visitors we get at our website. It's just going through the stratosphere right now. We, we can't really keep up with everything. So we're sort of pleasantly overwhelmed. <laughs> um, anyway, it's really great to have a, some visitors today. And just thanks for coming. I hope you'll continue to do that with the other topics that interest you by going there, not just going to the website, you know. It's definitely not the same. So um, thanks for coming. Um, I, uh, as I say, I came here eight years ago. And my background in music. I was living in LA writing songs and playing the piano. And I had absolutely no background at all in building. And uh, in short measure, after being here studying for a while, I was out building houses for people, actually private, and be building a beach house for somebody. And then I thought that the city here was magic. And I could hardly even know the right end of a shovel when I showed up here. So one of the things that I hope you'll take away from your visit uh, to this place today is, is that it's, you know, there's lots of things that make a particular thing accessible to the public. Cost is usually one of them. Cost can sort out, it stratifies us straight away. And one of the things that's really great about this work is that it's affordable. Um, and that's because you build out of the stuff from the earth. It's earth architecture. So wherever you go, the earth's right there, and you dig, and that's your primary building material. That makes it affordable. Um, and, uh, but it's also easy. It's actually easy to learn how to do this. Um, and in fact, we teach workshops, and you might hear about that later from Shinto or from one of us. I'm not going to talk about our workshops, but just that we teach in a week how to build these things. And if a musician with no background whatsoever can now be building privately for people, and it's mad. You know, it's a very, very simple way of putting these things together. And, um, <laughs> with the huge thick walls, hardly any electrical 
vice versa. <laughs> That's a thought. But this is just our straw bale house. So you have, you know, a, a wall width of straw rather than a wall width of earth in this house. So you still get the cell phone signals. But those of you who are trying to avoid such things and get away from all the <coughs> invisible forces that are bombing through the air, that's one of the advantages of these houses as well. So you're talking about a really uh, wonderful cost and affordability um, profile. You're talking about something that's easy to build. Um, and a lot of people come because they're interested in health. You know, they're interested in natural. And um, these are mostly natural houses. Um, the buildings we tested here uh, for um, permitting were all just with the earth. We didn't put any cement in them. And so it was a, truly an earth house. It's a natural earth house. Well, if you're interested in that, being inside material that has no uh, health issues related to it, and it's, it's good for that. There's architecture works. And I think that we can all agree that there's, a, there's something unique kind of charming about these things too. There's a beauty really that I think comes out that curves, it's curves. Mm. It's, that's what, that's the big difference with our work and, uh, compared to other architecture. And we love all of the rest of this amazing um, alternative architecture going on right now. And we support it all, the straw bale and the, the guy doing these earth ships in, in the earth in New Mexico. Really great thing. But what Cal Earth is, um, is we combine the earth using that as our primary building element and curvilinear because there's value in building with curves. And it's not new, obviously. You look around through architectural history and you see bridges that, that do this, you know. You see arches used by churches and mosques and all of these amazing things in history. So the arch is already understood to be a very unique, uh, it has a unique character. And because we use arches in conjunction with the earth, we can build structures that are extremely strong without all the modern material, without steel and rebar and all this reinforcement and heavy gauge gear that modern buildings need. You don't need that if you go back to using the arches. So uh, for 20 years, um, the architect, Nala Khalili, was exploring all of this stuff. I came in pretty late, really, eight years ago. I took an apprenticeship here. Four years after that, the architect himself passed away. And um, there was a bit, of a bit of a shift, you know, we all tried to figure out how to keep the place going, really. What it was going to take to keep the doors open and keep the work that had already been done previously, keep it going. So we jammed our foot in the door four years ago and said, this place is going to continue and we're really going to keep things moving. And fortunately, the architect had a couple of kids, um, one of uh, whom is with us today, Shifta, and all his daughter, and she's going to come and have a few words with you as well. But because now I had these kids and some of our apprentices, we sort of rescued this thing and really brought it back to life. And uh, that happened to correspond to it, a shift, you know, in, in public understanding of all of the issues all the time. And you know, we're really going great guns right now. It's great that the demand is pretty much outpacing our, our ability to respond. But awful, you call us up, we <coughs> almost never get back to you, you know, not because we're not interested, but because we're, there's 300 people in front, you know. So it's good. Things are good. But, um, I will um, pass, pass the baton to uh, Shifta now, and she'll tell you about the history of this, and her father, and some really wonderful stories about um, what brought this work to where it is now. And, uh, you know, being, being a modern, uh, modern man, I'm going to go on out of the kitchen and chop vegetables. <laughs> because we all wear many hats here and do all kinds of different things from the, the grand to the simple. And uh, we'll go off a potluck after this. And I hope that some of you will stay and have some lunch with us. So I'm going to go and prepare that and pass it on to the chief there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so raise your hand if this is your first visit to Cal Earth. 
Wow, that's amazing. Um, it's funny, my father, whenever, when he was here, he would, uh, you know, every open house, because this was before when our you know, websites weren't really that popular and things, and every month, you know, the room would be full, the roomy dome would be full, and he would just look around and he would say, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> he never understood how you kept showing up, you know, so. Um, we're really thrilled that all of you are here. My brother, unfortunately, couldn't be here today, um, but some of you might have seen him in the past. We usually tag team our stories, so today I'm going to tell some of his favorite stories as well, so you get a little sense of what he likes to tell at, at Open House. Um, so yeah, the tradition of Open House is that the first Saturday of every month, my father would open the gate and he would let people come in, because, you know, even now, and it's kind of an ongoing joke at Cal Earth, that if you leave the gate open, someone will wander in, you know, so we always keep the gates locked other times of the year, because this is a building site, and there's barbed wire everywhere, and so we don't want anybody just wandering in on their own. Um, so yeah, always people would be like peering through the fence, climbing over the fence, you know, we would find them inside the domes, we're roaming around like, what is this place, you know, so um, yeah, so I'm really, really glad that all of you are able to be with us today. So Cal Earth is a nonprofit foundation dedicated to research and teaching, um, and it's it's a really interesting story about how it started because my father he was uh, trained as as an architect building skyscrapers and parking structures that was his specialty. Um, he had come to the United States in the '60s and kind of you know studied here and done his work. And, uh, eventually, in the '70s, he went back to Iran actually to to continue working there because. Anyone maybe that remembers that far back that was alive remembers that the U.S. and Iran used to have a positive relationship. I don't know if anyone remembers that. But, um, yeah, so he was in Iran building. There were some of the American companies there that he was working with. And he was an urban developer. He was building uh, buildings all over the country. He was you know, bidding on big projects, making big money, really, really well-known and successful. Um, and totally miserable. He hated what he was doing. He was just mm -hmm. so miserable. You know, there was constantly a battle, you know, he had so much stress and so much anxiety about how is he going to get the next big project and a bigger project and bigger than the next big, you know, that kind of thing. So the story goes that one day, um, he took my brother to the park, and Daston is now, you know, a grown man. So it's funnier when I tell the story and he's standing here, because the story's about when he was like a little kid, you know. But he's not here, so we'll talk behind his back, it's fine. So, um, yeah, he was maybe three years old, and they went to the park together. My dad was really stressed, and you know. So anyway, the other kids at the park were running races. So my father, my father said, "Okay, Daston, you know, get on the line. You're gonna play with the kids. Yeah. You know, I want you to yeah. run the race." So they said, "One, two, three, go!" And all the kids took off running. So my poor brother, you know, he was the smallest, and the slowest, and actually the laziest. If he was here, I wouldn't have said that. But when he was three, he was a little lazy. He didn't want to run, you know. And so he kept coming in last place over and over and over again. So. And eventually he got fed up, because he kept losing, and he came to my father crying, crying. And he said, Bobo, Bobo, I want to race alone. <laughs> you know, it <laughs> <laughs> you know, doesn't make any sense. Like, it's not a race unless you're going against other kids. Da, 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 da. He's sort of telling him this, and then he says, he sort of realizes, why am I telling my three-year-old? Like, he doesn't understand, you know? Let me just let him do what he wants. Like, so anyway, so all the kids had left, so he drew a line. He said, one, two, three, go. So Daslan took off running by himself this time. And it took him even longer than usual to get back. He came back even slower, but he had come back and he had brought uh, this leaf from a sycamore tree. And the next time around, he had come back and he brought a flower. And, and it went on and on like this. And my father was watching him and watching him. And he sort of realized that, you know, not only was he enjoying himself much more when he was racing alone, but that every time he came back, he was always in first place, you know? <laughs> and so my father sort of thought, you know, it's funny because we're constantly racing against other people, right? And, and if you beat that person, sure, yeah, you, you met their expectation, maybe exceeded a little bit more if you're better than them. But, but if you're racing alone, you have this opportunity to constantly meet and exceed your own expectations, right? That you're in charge of that. So really shortly thereafter, he closed the doors of his office and bought a motorcycle. It wasn't a midlife crisis, everyone. <laughs> but he kind of was. Uh, he went into the desert, and for many years, he about five years, he traveled to and from the deserts all around Iran, studying the traditional architecture of the area and kind of getting a sense of, you know, he was looking for a purpose, you know, to build for a reason, not just to build a, you know, a little ticky-tacky house like our neighbors around the corner, but to actually build something that 
that was needed or that was you know important. And so he he kind of had this idea about well, how do you build for people who don't have access to anything except for what's there, right? In the desert, all over Iran, there's all these adobe buildings that have been standing for thousands of years, and you know obviously they have their drawbacks, but there's it's, that's the only thing they have available, so that's what they build with. So he, you know, so he kind of was traveling around and not really sure what he was going to do next, but every village he went to, he kept seeing these beautiful adobe homes, but one or two of them would always have a big hole in the roof, you know. People would say, you know, it's really dangerous. The only problem here is that when it rains and when it snows, um, it's a desert, but it happens sometimes, and then the roof would collapse because it would just, unless it was really well maintained, you know, it's obviously just clay, it's earth, it's not stabilized in any way, so it would fall through and... They were really kind of worried. So he meditated on it for a while, and he said, well, how, what could I do? What else could I do here, you know? And so he came up with this idea of firing these houses, of turning them to ceramic, you know, that if a house is built of clay, just like a pot is built of clay, right, that you could fire it and turn it to, to a ceramic and that it would be so much stronger. So anyway, there was this little period of time where he was kind of trying to propose this to people, you know, the competition went a little something like this, you know, he would go knock on someone's door and they would answer, and he would say, I'm this architect, you know, I'm from Tehran, and uh, I have this plan, excuse me, can I set your house on fire? <laughs> 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 so, not so good at first, you know, <laughs> uh, until one day, they were, they were in this village, and all this is in his first book, which is actually called Racing Alone, but in this village, they had a kiln at the center, and it was built in the same bright clay adobe, and, uh, he was kind of talking to some people about it. He said, tell me about this, you know. He said, oh, this is so strong. You know, you could shoot a cannonball at it. Nothing would happen. He said, well, yeah, this is the same thing as your house, but it's been fired over and over and over again. But now it's this, you know, really strong structure. So they said, oh, yeah, okay. You know. So they did, and they, they fired a pre-existing structure that was just in place in one of these villages, inside and out, for 48 hours. And the first thing that happened, you know, all these people were standing by a little bit nervous, but first thing that happened is all the rodents ran out from under the <laughs> And they were like, ah, you know, beating them with the broom, like, that's the one that bit my son. <laughs> so anyway, you know, after 48 hours, there's this beautiful structure standing there. And, you know, what a risk, though, just to do research on something pre-existing, no, no control variables. But it turned out really nicely. And uh, from there, my, my father continued to do projects. By now, we we're in the late 70s. And, Anyone knows about what's going on in Iran? The revolution started, um, which I think is part of the reason why he got away with as much as he did, because no one was paying much attention to him. You know? <laughs> now you would just be able to go set people's houses on fire without anyone finding out. Um, but uh, but actually, during that time, he was able to to bid, and he was given the opportunity to build an entire school in, in Iran, a 19 classroom school that still stands today. You can see in in the ceramic houses book, and it's. It's amazing, you know, it was it was a really big opportunity for him, and he was thrilled, you know, that this idea of it would come to fruition. But again, you know, the the revolution had started, the Iran-Iraq war was on the horizon, and he had this realization that if the point of this work is to reach the people that it really needs to get to, you know, in the middle of Iran, in the middle of a revolution, the word was never going to get out, you know. Um, and he decided it was time for him to come back to come back to the United States and, and do the work here. Because obviously maybe the people here didn't need it in the same way, but the exposure would be there and the, the opportunity to, to go back out into the world. So he came here and um, he started traveling around, you know, he had those slide projectors with the, with the actual slides in them. You know, and he would carry them around and he was giving lectures all over the country and all over the world actually for, for years. That was what he did, you know, until about 1984, um, and then there was a call for papers for NASA. So he had, you know, before I tell you that story, he he'd been traveling around and he had this whole speech, you know, about I I build with the universal principles, earth, water, air, and fire, the universal principles and geometry, and I'm able to, you know, it's really the solution. So anyway, so this call for papers came for NASA on how to build on the moon and Mars. Right? He'd been traveling around the country telling everybody that he had been building the universal principles and that you could build anywhere. And so he sort of sat one day and he thought, oh boy, you know, well, can you really build anywhere? Could you build on the moon? Like, what is, is that actually a possibility? You know? So he sat and meditated on a while and, um, you know, he, he was really inspired by the poet Rumi, as you might have already seen. He's, he had translated, just for fun, 
two full books of poetry. Um, just kind of as he went through life, every once in a while, he would you know need some kind of motivation or direction. He would just open up that book and he would find a line, and that line would somehow speak to him. You know? So anyway, during this time, you know, he had been researching the moon and Mars, and he was like, well, there's no air on the moon, there's no fire, there's they have that soil that's on the moon, but there's no water. At the time, they didn't know that there was water. He said, well, what am I going to do? You know, I really feel like I should send a paper, but how am I going to say we should build on the moon using what's available if there's nothing other than that soil there? So he uh, kind of did some meditating, and there's this poem from Rumi that basically says that, you know, earth, water, air, and fire are dead to you and me, but they're alive in God's presence. Right? Yeah. So he meditated on it, and he thought about it, and he found out that the soil on the moon has a really high glass content. So he thought, you know, with that high glass content, we could bring a magnifying lens and we could create fire and we could melt it and create these shells, right? You pile up a big pile of this soil and melt it and you're left with a shell. And this other idea would be to take this type of tubing that at that time he called Velcro adobe and that you would wind it up and you would Velcro the layers together, you know, you suck in that lunar dust, and that you would build your buildings with this Velcro adobe. So he sent this paper to NASA, you know, which is crazy thinking back, because his English really wasn't that great at the time, and, you know, he was just an architect from Iran, he wasn't like some kind of engineer or scientist or anything, but, you know, he had sort of spun the paper with the right jargon, and then they accepted it. And he came, and that day at the symposium, uh, it was this huge auditorium full of people, and everyone there were engineers and scientists, he was the only architect there. And the keynote speaker had gone on stage that day and said that for every pound of material that you take to the moon, it costs two pounds in gold. So an ounce of gold now is about like $1,800. So just think of that. Think of the, the you know, crazy price of just one pound. And so someone was there from Port Portland Cement, I went on stage and proposed that, you know, well, let's take two tons of water to the moon, and let's build a cement factory, and, you know, blah, blah. So, so he got on stage, and was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell these people? You know? So we had eight minutes, and five minutes for question and answer. So I got on stage, and he told all these ideas, right, that I want to build single and double curvature structures using in situ regolith, you know, I want to build domes and vaults using the soil on the moon. That's what I want to do. And, and then that was it. That was finished his whole speech in eight minutes with the slides. And after he finished, all the hands in the room went up. And he was like, uh, no, 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 I can't take any questions. I don't actually have any more information than what I've just given you. <laughs> he said, but I, I want to find it. I want to find the answers. And, you know, that day before he had spoken, you know, when that, when that man had gone up there and talked about the price of the earth, I mean, sorry, the price of the gold and the price of materials, you know, he was really, really inspired by this poem from Rumi that you'll find all over our, you know, t-shirts and everything that says, earth turns to gold in the hands of the wise, you know. Mm -hmm. So when he went up there that day, he felt really empowered by that and to be able to speak with a solution that was literally using what was on site and just a little, little bit more than that, that, that was what you could do to build, like how much more sustainable than to use what's actually there. So yeah, so he went and he sat down and they give him a little card table with a little, you know, sheet on it or whatever, and he had some photocopies. His, his book racing law wasn't even out yet. You know, he literally run some photocopies and stapled them together and was selling them for ten dollars. <laughs> and so some scientists from Los Alamos National Laboratory had come and seen him, and they said, you know, Mr. Haleli, we want to invite you to come to our site and to do as much re as much research as you want. Uh, so we went to Los Alamos and spent a couple of weeks there you know, fusing bricks, using the highest technology, these magnifying lenses, and just really, really working through it. And I think after that is when he really got motivated that he was tired of talking, you know, he was tired of going around telling people about his ideas, and that it was about time for him to begin to do his ideas. So um, he'd been invited to, to teach at SciArc, which is an architecture school in Santa Monica. And he did that for a few years, and you know, and then he, and then in 1991, he came here, and he was looking for a piece of land somewhere, you know, kind of inexpensive that was in an extreme climate. So he came out here, which it seems seems arbitrary that we're in the middle of this area in this bizarre little town, which makes no sense. But the truth of the matter is that we're in the high desert, above 4,000 elevation. We get snow here in the winter. Our summer gets up to 110. We have high winds, flash floods. We're right next to the San Andreas Fault. 
I mean, I really can't think of a better place to really test and see if this is going to work, you know? So thanks to all of you who drove from, you know, wherever you came from to come to this weird place. But, um, but it's worth it, you know, that we've really been able to test it. You know, the only thing we can't really test that we, that we are limited in is, is waterproofing. We just don't get enough rain. But, but we have, you know, done the research. So anyways, but we'll get to that. So anyway, so I came here and he spent a few years, just kind of, he had a couple of students, and, and at first, you know, he had no plan. Similar to when he was going door to door asking people to set the house on fire, you know, just kind of hoping that something was gonna come through. So they sat here for a little while, and he told his students, okay, students, you know, we're gonna begin. And they said, okay, professor, what are we gonna do first? And he's like, well, no plan, no plan at all. Well, obviously the first thing we need to do is we need to dig a pit. Let's dig a pit, everyone. So he's like, okay, professor. So they get their shovels and they begin digging for a while, you know. So meanwhile, the pit's getting bigger and he's like, I don't have to do now, you know. I don't have plenty of material. I just have to do. So, um, and as before this had happened, he had done one private project near Santa Barbara um, where they built a, a big dome and they had fired it. And, you know, so anyway, so some people knew about his work. And he got a phone call from the Higgins Brick Company. And they said, hey, Mr. Kalula, we know about what you're doing. And we have these 50,000 reject bricks. You know, do you want them? He's like, yeah, of course I want them. You know, no plan at all. So they bring 50,000 bricks to the site, pile them up over here behind the, behind the straw bell dome, which wasn't here. And he said, OK, great. Has he ever laid a brick before? No. Have any of his students ever laid bricks before? No. But with those 50,000 reject bricks and his handful of students with no experience of any kind in architecture, uh, they built the Rumi Dome, which stands now today. So that was the first project that they had begun on site, and it was really about this idea of how do you build with what you have? What do you, what can you build with, you know? And after that, you know, they kind of started to, to think about it, and he went back to this idea of what do you, what do you have access to everywhere in the world? Where do I want to build? I want to build in places, in refugee camps, in war-torn areas, after disasters, etc. And he thought, well, all these places have sandbags and they have barbed wire. And obviously he wasn't the first person in you know, the world to use sandbags for architecture. You know, it's been done. They built bunkers with it. And what better to use in the materials of war, right, for, to, to build your house? Why not? For peaceful purposes. So anyway, so he, he started with his group of students to build these sandbag houses. And they got some you know, rice bags donated or something. And they were those big 60-pound bags, big ones. So these students, it was a bit of a learning curve. So they were filling up these bags huge bags with just pure sand, nothing else. They would put the bag down on the ground, you know, they laid a bunch of barbed wire on top of it, and they continued, you know, and meanwhile, they're getting higher and higher, and these bags are so heavy, and they're kind of, uh, you know, heaving them up, and everyone's having all these back problems. And one day, these firefighters are driving past Cal Earth, and you used to be able to see it from the street, you know, these little houses that are over here, um, the what-not-to-do houses, you know, that are over here. <laughs> Uh, they were there, so you could see it from the street. People would often drive past and just wonder what was going on. You know, my father believed that you could learn something from anyone, so he really would. If he saw someone standing at the gate, he would let them in. You know, even if we weren't with them. So, firefighters came in. And said, what are you doing? So he showed them around. You know, really proud of his buildings. And they said, he said, hey, you're firefighters. You know, you guys work with sandbags all the time, doing flood flood areas. And said, yeah, yeah. He said, but how do you, you know, deal with the pain of the back, like you fill the bag, you put it on the wall, and it's so labor intensive. The firefighter was in like, no man, you put the bag on the wall and then you fill it when it's already up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm so sorry, apologizing to all these guys. <laughs> so but from there there was a huge shift um, to the coffee can, which is what we use now. That, you know, one coffee can at a time, just maybe about five pounds. And if you can carry one coffee can, you are a full participant in this work, you know, which, which really opened it up because at the beginning it was mostly men, you know, the first maybe year or something that were with Cal Earth. And then after that, I would say since then it's been a, almost a perfect 50 50 split. But women are half the population. What a waste, you know, from not even utilize them. And children and people who have certain disabilities, like they can participate fully in this architecture. But we've tried to simplify it to a point that. Literally anybody could do it. That you could go and teach a community of people and they could build their own house, right? But, so the coffee can became the next system. And then from there it kind of evolved to, okay, you know, the short bags are great, but but back to that idea that he had had of the Velcro Adobe, this the long tubing, and so he kind of 
worked on that and created this the system, which is now this patented system that Calvert has, the Super Adobe, the long bag, you know, and the kind of the way to build with this. It's much simpler even that, you know, my father was motivated by women putting on their stockings and he thought, oh, what a great idea, you know, to scrunch down the bag over a, like a tube and to fill it and kind of just take a step back, right? So depending on how big you are and how strong you are, you put two coffee cans or five coffee cans, but ultimately it still works the same way. So, um, so yeah, you know, and at that time, so it's about mid-90s now and my father's here in the middle of the desert in this weird piece of land in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> building and... Um, and then he sat one day and he said, you know what, it's time for me to do that one thing that every architect hates to do, I need to go to the building department. I need to go and I need to get a permit because there's only so long I can continue doing this without someone's permission. That if I'm going to stay on the fringe, this is never going to get, the whole point of me coming here was to build for people to get it to the out in the world. And if there's no permits, then this, is, this has no basis. You know, that obviously it's, it's horrible to have to cut through the bureaucratic red tape to get something done, but that's the system. So we went to the building department, we started hassling them, and we would go to their meetings every month. Hi, I'm this and that, I work here, I have this great piece of land, and I want you to come and test my buildings, and you can do anything you want, and just try and knock them down, and they're so great, and, they're, and they were like, man, get out of here, you know? We're not interested in your mud huts, just get out of here, you know? He's like, I'm gonna keep coming back, I'm gonna keep coming back, you have to come test our buildings, you have to come test, and they're like, look, you know, if you can prove to us, we need to see the numbers. We're not going to come and send our guys out to do seismic testing and do all these tests on your site. What's the point? We have no, there's no purpose for us to do it. So luckily at the time, you know, we're, we're self-sustaining all these years. We're not, we're not a grant-based nonprofit. That's not how we work. But some, and from time to time, different people have approached us and said, hey, we want to give you a grant to do your work. You know? So at that time, my father was given a grant randomly use the money to hire a private company to come and do the entire set of seismic tests that are required by the building department, which is so expensive. I mean, I don't even know, but thousands and thousands of dollars to do these tests, you know, where they come and they essentially, you can still see if the steel beams are still, like, around the site. There's one right in the middle here that you can go look at before you go have lunch. Um, and they basically wrapped a cable around the outside of the building and two cement trucks full of water tried to shear the building from place. Pull away, that's what the test, one of the main tests, right? To see if the building will stay in place or if it'll, and something like two millimeters of movement is failure. And it's something very ridiculous. So my father was like, okay, come, do it, tear my buildings down, you know? And so the building officials, the funny thing is that all these years, building officials have been coming through here, and they come here and they look around and like, Great, tell me about it. You know, I have no idea what they're even looking at, let alone how to do the tests. So they did, they, they tried to share the building from place and they went up to something like a few thousand PSI, you know, beyond, like 20 times beyond what was required by the building department. And they had to stop. The building official said, you know what, sir, we need to stop because our, our equipment is going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> My father's like, ha! <laughs> Shortly thereafter, that building official who had been just, you know, sticking it to him this whole time came and stood in one of these buildings and told CNN, you know, this is really something. And that was a big win, you know. And, and obviously, we still struggle with the building department. They change their codes every three years, so we have to go reintroduce ourselves and start all over every time. But now we have a basis, you know, we have an entire book, with this huge record of everything that we've done in the past 15, 20 years. And, so anyways, you know, and our, and our plans were even a stock plan in 2007, and, you know, right now we're working again to get into the next set of codes, and, and our ultimate goal, actually, because the funny thing is, it's like sticking a, what do they say, a square peg in a round hole, but it doesn't fit. We're, we're trying to fit ourselves into a pre-existing set of building codes that doesn't actually apply to this type of architecture, that we ourselves need to create a set of codes that this should be built by, and we need our own set of building inspectors who know how to test these kinds of buildings. So it's definitely a long process, but we are working and hoping that in the next, you know, every three years they create a new code that ultimately <coughs> we may be able to create our own code for our impact <coughs> building. Um, so yeah, you know, that kind of brings us to, to where we are now, that after all these years and all this research and, you know, my dad was continually distilling and simplifying the technique that how to build in the simplest way, that how to build anywhere, how to build with any person, any size, any material, you know, and that's what the point of the workshop became, that 
he would tell people, I want you to come here, and in a week I'm going to teach you everything I know. And I want you to go, and I want you to build. I want you to go and tell, teach your friends and, and hire your own family members to build with you. Or I'm going to be able to send you abroad when there's a disaster and have you, you know. So that was kind of his last dream that he wasn't able to achieve during his lifetime was this idea of distance teaching and distance learning. And so he passed away in 2008. Um, which was, you know, devastating, obviously, but even more so because he was at the center of the institute and everyone surrounded him. You know, he told us what to do next, always. It wasn't like there was a team of people deciding what to do at Calvary. You know, he listened to all of his students, but he was the one that had the vision and had the quest. So for all of us, after he was gone, we all sat together, my brother and I and Ian and a few of other apprentices. And we sat together in a room like this and, and asked on and I basically told everyone, listen, None of us have the answers anymore, but I think collectively we can. We all knew enough about this work that we said, well, what do we think that he would have wanted us to do next? You know, which is obviously continue. That was the main thing, to continue and that the rest would fall into place. You know, so we did for a year. We just kind of tried to put the pieces back together and figure out how to run this site without its um, without its main person. So here we are now. You know, almost coming up on five years later, and. It's thriving. It's thriving in a way that I don't think any of us really expected it would. And the reason is because somehow in his last year of life, my father, you know, he it was like he tied up all the everything with a bow and a ribbon and left it behind for us. You know, my, my brother had created a DVD series of the apprenticeship program just the year before. So the entire apprenticeship, all the lectures that my father gave are on film now. And he created this book, the Emergency Shout Sand Eye Shelter book. And it was at the printing press. He didn't even see it come to print, but it was waiting at the printing press. You know? I mean, things like that. That, and he had just gotten a residence permit for Earth One. You know, that it was finished. That it was ready for us. And just imagine that. You know, he created something from inception and brought it to here, and that this became our jumping off point. You know, this it's a huge privilege and opportunity, and obviously a little scary. Um, but somehow we've we've been able to put it together, and I think part of the reason is because. Calorie kind of moves on its own. You know, we're just kind of here to, to nudge it along, but it is really its own thing. You know, Ian was saying that so many people are contacting us more than we even know what to do with, which is a blessing and a, and a curse because we want to do so much more, and we're just only at, we only have so much you know, capacity. So, But in the past couple of years, you know, we've done almost like 15 international workshops. I mean, what a, it's unbelievable. We're in Australia. Right now, as we speak, there's a group in Colombia teaching this exact workshop that we do here. You know, that we've done four workshops in Spain this year, that we have two more on the books, that we have two in Australia planned for December. I mean, it's just, and there's this long list of people that are saying, I want to do a workshop in South Africa and Russia and Djibouti and this. You know, it's like, I can't believe it, really, honestly. And so, you know, we take this opportunity at Open House so that people can come in and see what we do here. And, it's not for everybody, and it's not for everything, and, you know, we're not saying this is the solution, but we're basically saying that this is a color in the palette that you should have, and, and if you don't have it, you might be missing out on something that could really work for you wherever you are in your land, or wherever, whatever you want to do, you know, so there's so many great building techniques, like this one, for example, this is half sandbags, half straw bales, you know, with a cob, kind of earth plaster, I mean, it's all mixed together, with latex paint, I mean, obviously you don't want to do latex paint. But, you know, that we've tried to find ways to really integrate, to make this flexible so that you could take it somewhere in the world and you could put what they want onto it. Um, two years ago, right after the earthquake in Haiti, the disaster over there, I went to Haiti and they told me what they wanted. They said, well, we want to be able to do this and we want it to look like this. And so we built a dome to their specifications. And we've had multiple groups of Haitians come here and say, yeah, this could really work. You know, and, and we have some groups over there actually working now. So, you know, we're really trying to be sensitive to, to local traditions and customs. And like I said, that our waterproofing is maybe limited because we don't get hundreds of inches of rain here. But we have a guy who built at the edge of the Amazon. And instead of reading a book on waterproofing, he went and talked to the local people and said, how do you waterproof here? And that's what he did on his building. And it's something that included, like, honey and different, I mean, really secret ingredients that we don't need to know about over here because it's not relevant. But, right, this is something that... The point of this architecture that it is, these universal principles that, you know, if you use them together with, with whatever local customs are, you're really able to achieve so much. So, um, you know, now that all of you have been here, you've seen what we have, and, you know, you always wonder what, what you should do next. And so that's kind of, 
this other opportunity that we have that we want. We want you to come. We want you to come and build and come and learn and study with us. Like I said, we're a nonprofit. We're self-sustaining. And you know, these workshops is really where our entire operation runs off of. And you know, it's some people say it's too expensive for me. And we say, well, come for a week ahead of time, do work study with us, you know, help us around the site. We'll give you 25% off. You know, we have these different ways because my father believes that anyone who wants to learn should be able to learn. So, you know, we've sort of managed to make sure that every person who wanted to come to the workshop can do that. And, you know, maybe it's not quite for you, but you know someone who's interested, please tell them about it. Bring them to the next open house. I recognize some of you, you come with a new friend every time, you know, so it's, it's really great. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to close. I'm going to tell you two quick stories, and then we'll head out to, to grab some lunch. Um, my father always loved to take the opportunity at open house, because it was like he got a free room full of people to talk to, you know? Like, hey, you're here. Let me tell you all my favorite stories, you know? Um, so this story is from Rumi from 800 years ago. And it's my favorite story. I tell this at every open house. Um, and it's about this man who, he lost his camel. And he was so devastated, you know, it was his favorite camel. And he, he went around to all the villagers and said, have you seen my camel? He drew a picture of it. It's just brown, it has a white spot. Please, can you help me find it? It's, it's so important to me. And they said, sure, of course, we're going to help you. Mama. Absolutely, let's go. Let's work on it. Let's go find the camel. And there was another man in the village who was a bit of a skeptic, and you know he was kind of negative, and he was like, I bet this guy didn't actually lose a camel. I bet he just wants everyone's attention. You know, he's just needy like that. And so I'm going to follow him around, and I'm going to get the truth. I'm going to find out what's really going on. So he followed this man around as well, and they went on this journey to look for this camel. And some people were asking this other negative guy, so what are you doing with us on this journey? You know, knowing what kind of guy he was, and the guy's like, oh yeah, me too. I, I also lost my camel, so I'm coming along. You know, thinking that was. Secret way to get in with the group. So they said, sure, we'll help you also find your person. So they went on for days and days on this difficult journey. And eventually one day they came to this wide open prairie, and there's all these wild horses and camels everywhere. And that first man looked around, looked around, and then all of a sudden, sure enough, there was his camel, and he ran to it, and it was it was his camel. It was brown with a white spot, and he hugged it and petted it, and he was so thrilled that he found his camel. So he roped it up and they were getting ready to leave. And all the caravan, all the friends and people were so thrilled that, yes, you know, we've done what we came out to do. And so and this man is, you know, with his camel, he's looking around for that other guy, the skeptic that we get through in a hard time. And he's like, where is he, you know? And then he sees him out in the distance, standing amongst all these camels. And he goes over to him and he's like, what are you doing here, you know? We've done what we've, we've I found my camel, we're ready to go back. What are you, what are you doing? What's what over here? That man kind of looks down, he looks at him, he's like, well... Okay, so you're not going to believe what I'm going to say, but, you know, you see this camel? So this guy, I see this camel. He says, well, it turns out this is my camel. He said, I didn't even know I had a camel, but this is my camel, you know? And um, Rumi says that, you know, sometimes we don't always know what it is that we're looking for, what are we looking for, but as long as you go along with those who do, who are on some kind of journey, who are on some kind of quest, that you two eventually will stumble across what it is that's your, that is your destiny, or, you know, you'll find your camel. And that happens a lot to people here at Calard, that somehow just by coming here, by interacting with one another and the group of people that come through here, because regular people don't just come to Calard. You know, people who show up here are, are the kind of people who are trying to think a little bit more than just, you know, they're, they're not just limited by the blinders, but they're really trying to look to the outside. And, and the truth is that you would be doing yourself a huge injustice if not only did you spend some time talking to the students and apprentices who are here, but to the people that are in this room. Because all of our students and apprentices come from the people in this room, you know. So one of you here probably already has figured out exactly what you want to do, and you have a plan all set out, and the rest of you are sort of wandering around, you know, not sure what you're looking for. But but somehow, you know, the pieces come together. So I hope that you take this opportunity to get to know one another and, you know, that you find your camel, as my father would say. And, um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's really a privilege to stand here and, and to tell you these stories and just to, to share with you a little bit about my father's, you know, his quest, right? His, he found his camel and he was on his journey and he knew exactly where he wanted to be. And there's this roomy poem that says that, um, the quest is the key to all of your desires, right? That it's the quest that he says, um, seek not water, seek thirst. That, that instead of looking for the water, you, sh you know, you should find out where the thirst is because eventually the thirst will lead you to the water. You know?
know, that you should find out what it is that you're thirsty for, what it is that you're really, you know, what is your quest, what is your destiny, right? And to follow it every morning that you wake up without a, without a quest, without a purpose, it was a wasted morning, my father would say. But, you know, you know, sometimes you lose track, but if you have to wake up in the morning and remember, you know, what's the point of what you're doing? Where are you really headed? And, you know, this is so much more than just an architecture institute. And, you know, it's just so much love and care that went into every building. Every building that you see here at this site was built by people just like you, students, like Ian would say, who didn't know the right side of a shovel before they showed up, you know? And it's full of imperfections. You know, we leave everything just as it was done because you're really going to say, I mean, have you ever seen an ugly tree or like an ugly flower or something? No, you know, it, it is as it is, right? And, and these buildings are like that. The natural buildings just kind of come together in this really beautiful way that we leave the curves in the walls, that the floors are a little bit crooked, but it doesn't really matter. You know, if you want to buy your furniture from Ikea, it becomes a problem that your walls are not straight. But, <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, I hope you guys really enjoy yourselves today and walk around, stay for lunch, um, ask questions. Um, I brought some stuff just because what usually ends up happening is that if I don't do this, all of you will go individually into the bookstore and ask the person at the desk what book you should buy. <laughs> so I'm just going to do it really quickly here so that if you have questions, then you'll know. You'll go in with a little bit more information. So, um, so if you want to hear my father tell his, this is one of his open house lectures. Uh, from 2007. So if you want to hear him tell the stories about Calware, some of the same ones I've told and some other really special ones. This is the, that's this film. Um, the Ecodome film is a documentary. These are all made by, made by, made by my brother, um, who's actually a filmmaker. And this is the Ecodome. This is the documentary of literally the beginning to the end of how we built the Ecodome. Um, and then this is the book that I was telling you before that was you know, at the printer that my father actually never saw published. Um, he approved of the whole thing and saw the cover, but he never actually got, got a full copy of this book. So this is uh, sort of his, the manual that he put together that shows you, you know, how to build. Um, if you're not able to come to a workshop, this is enough for you to go home with a little roll of bags and build a, one of those little emergency shelter domes uh, in your yard. You don't want to build an eco-dome without coming to a workshop. It's a bit more involved. But if you want to build some garden beds or some seats or something, this will, this will be really great. Um, and then I'll pass around some copies of the newsletter if you didn't get a chance to pick it up. Uh, we, we send it out a couple of times a year. You can sign up for it on the website. And the last thing I want to tell you is, like I said before, you know, we have workshops about 10, 10 times a year. Um, there's one coming up on September 10th, and then the permaculture workshop, which we're really excited about, which is a dual certification that you get with the permaculture certification and the calories workshop, obviously. It's integrated together. It was the first time we did it last year, and this year we've actually improved it significantly, so every day is a combination of earth architecture and permaculture with this group that we're working with. Because um, so we're really trying to now move to the next step, which is right to integrate the, the technology and you know the community building and how to you know do the solar and the all that stuff within within the workshop. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we have this new thing that we really want to, you know, appreciate you for showing up here before you don't really even know, you're not really sure what you were going to show up to today. So um, if you want to register for the workshop and you come to Open House, you you do get a hundred fifty dollar discount off the workshop just for being here. You know, we want to um, give you that opportunity. So if you have any questions about the workshop, talk to Bridget Butler. She's the workshop coordinator. Um, and then I'll close with that. I'll hand these out, and then we'll actually stay in here. Dave Walker, if you want to come in here for a minute.